Hey, good morning, everyone. So I'm actually talking about a project we're working on at Esri. I'm actually started by Chris Helm, who couldn't be here. He's busy enjoying Costa Rica. Um, but it's a project called Coop, which is a pretty interesting project. Um, so what it is, it's a, essentially taking any web API out there and converting it into GeoJSON and feature services. Um, nice way it scrolls off the page there. Um, the kind of thing that drove this here is we have a lot of APIs out there, 311 APIs, things like that, that have their own unique uh, flavor every single time. We want to make sure and pull those in and do filtering and analysis and visualization on those. So think of it as an ETL for APIs, to throw more acronyms in there. So the way it works is uh, there's a, in the Coop ser server in the middle here, it's all Node JavaScript. You write different providers that tap into your REST APIs. It then ejects those out as uh, feature servers, GeoJSON, and I'll show you some other examples of things it's dumping out to as well. And it can optionally have a cache uh, internally. Um, so it's all on GitHub, on Esri slash Coop. You can go play with it. Um, so the repo's there. You can go grab it. There's a Coop main project. There's a whole bunch of other... Uh, there's the Coop server, and there's a whole bunch of other providers. I've shown here a couple that I'm working on. We have a Coop ArcGIS Online, Coop Elasticsearch, uh, Sample Provider, Coop GIST, so on and so forth. So, for example, you can go and take and say, if there's a GIST out there, and it happens to be, in this case, GeoJSON, I click Map, it goes and gives me a quick map preview of it. Super basic, super simple. Mapbox, already, uh, Mapbox provides the tiles to GitHub to do that. That's awesome. But we want to do more with it. So, for example, here is City of Philadelphia has all their school facilities data here. Why don't I can go grab that a CSV GeoJSON KML? Cool, because they've uploaded it and cached it there a year ago, so it's probably not up to date. But that's a whole other blog post. Um, so using Coop, we can reflect that out and grab the GeoJSON and convert it into feature services. So I can go and use it in my GIS and go do analysis, go do visualizations, things like that, directly out of that GitHub repository. I don't have to move the data around. It points back to that. Theme it, query, filter, do drive time analyses around my GitHub hosted GeoJSON files. So there's other adapters and other uh, APIs um, out there. And then also already builds in, uh, using open source tools, the ability to export via GeoJSON, KML, CSV, shapefile, and more. Uh, it's R&D. We work for the R&D center. So we've already prototyped out, dumping out UTF grids, vector tiles, PNG tiles, all from any of these arbitrary APIs. So if you had a bus tracking API, a 311 API, um, anything like that, you can go and even Flickr, for example, and turn that into GeoJSON or PNG tiles or things like that on top of it. So you wouldn't want to play with one of the things we've been doing with is how do we actually make OpenStreetMap itself more accessible for people to do analysis and visualization with. So you can use this. There's an OSM output provider that you can go and grab um, to get, you know, if you ever want to play with your new GeoJSON libraries. I just need a lot of lines, for example. You can go and grab them by type. That's useful for technologists. But I want to go and grab them by state and get the count of them by state. Um, I can go and get the number of cafes and start doing where clause queries against these via a, at least a query UI, and then I can actually make it restful because it's pretty easy in Node to add more route endpoints there. You can even go and, and start diving into this more and more, even get distinct values here. So um, something we built to kind of explore this is uh, this little example here. So it's a, a little map. I can go and say, we'll click on, you know, in Oregon and Multnomah County. Dive into there. Now I actually want to go get by, for example, amenity here. And I want to go and get, it's very important to always know where your local toilets are. So great, cool. I have this, uh, this little URL. This is querying against a uh, OSM planet import. It's now dumping this out as a GeoJSON feature collection with all the different features there by at least a defined scheme at this point. So I can go take this, go pull this into um, curl it, do uh, to pull into GeoJSON IO, for example, and I can go and map that out, right? So it's really, ex things like OpenStreetMap is just one example, really accessible for people to play with very quickly and very, very easily. So um, you can keep driving into it. So there's a UI for it. Uh, that's really it. It's a, it's a pretty cool project. We're using it behind the scenes in a couple of projects like ArcGIS Open Data, but we also are seeing cities want to adapt it as a way to make their APIs already out there more accessible for developers like us to go and do cool things with it in whatever libraries we want to use. So finish early. Thank, Thank you very much, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. I'm Jubal Harvester from Spatial Dev. Um, so they pinged me this weekend and said, we have some extra time. Can you talk? And I actually had nothing can to talk about. So when I was working on my slides this morning at 2 in the, two in the morning, I was trying to figure out what we were going to talk about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this by saying that I'm not a developer. My team does not let me write code anymore. And I, uh, <laughs> and I actually didn't implement any of the things that I'm going to show today. So my role in the organization now is sitting between uh, demanding clients and uh, brilliant but very opinionated developers. Um, uh, so let me just launch into it. So um, one of the things I hear all the time is this too slow. We all hear this, right? This is everybody's favorite. And we say slow relative to what? What you want. 
what your data says, how fast it can go. Um, what does that mean exactly? So in this particular example, there was a client that had uh, 70,000 points and they wanted to use leaflet uh, clusters and we wanted to classify those points. Um, and what we were doing was taking about 10 seconds and that was just not good enough. Um, so we rewrote the uh, leaflet cluster marker library um, to get some SVGs out and inject some S3 goodness into them so we could dynamically cluster, I think we can get up about 90,000 points in two seconds down to the client. Um, and here's the uh, required screenshot. And you can see some magical uh, points getting clustered and they move around, it's very fast. Um, so that's one example. And these examples that I'm showing, each of them is about a 30 minute talk, which I don't have time for obviously. Um, but they're all driven by the clients where, where the ac application is deployed. And, and in our work, it's uh, mostly in the developing world where bandwidth is an issue, uh, computers are an issue, um, browser versions are major issues. Um, so uh, the next one I have is it takes too much bandwidth. And I always say, what does that mean? Um, they say, well, you we were in the hotel in Tanzania, and then we took it out to the country, and the application didn't work anymore. And I said, well, it's a website. Of course it didn't work anymore. And I said, no, we want the same experience uh, when it's not connected as when it is connected. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what are you going to do? Okay, so uh, we do, we're, we're, we're doing more and on and offline. So right now we have a virtualized environment for some of our apps, uh, but we're moving to Node WebKit. So when, we, when the customer takes that data or unplugs the internet, they, they get the same experience. And where this is headed, at least in our work, is that they want the same experience regardless of the device and regardless of the internet connectivity. So it's m mobile form factors, desktop web, um, and then on and offline. And here's, so here's an example. We actually did deliver a virtualized environment with everything uh, packed into one deliverable. Of course, the virtual environment is too big for any uh, sort of realistic distribution, but we're certainly we're working on that. Um, it's too expensive. We all hear that. It doesn't scale. We didn't, and then I said, what, what does that mean? It doesn't scale. Like, you want more servers, you want, you want it faster, you want more data. And what I typically hear is if we have, you know, we want to show 10, 10 million points. And this, we're not, no, no, we're not going to do that. We have uh, 10,000 layers. No, we're not going to do that either. Um, so we want to have some balance of, of scale and cost so that we can actually implement something that's reasonable for the client. Um, in this particular case, um, with scalability for them meant they have to buy too many servers in order to serve the number of data layers that they wanted to serve across the globe that were very complex. Um, so we started working on uh, Node.js, Node PostGIS, you know, wrappers um, that can dynamically generate tiles and dynamically generate vector tiles based on uh, REST queries. Um, and then we're working on some leaflet canvas stuff that uh, we can have Matnik PDFs uh, come right down and consume them in, in leaflet. Um, there's a URL for that if you want to go check it out on Git. Uh, all of our stuff is open. Actually, about I think we've exposed about a third of our repos and we're working on the rest of them, uh, getting them cleaned up and sort of ready for prime time, if you will. Um, and that's so cheap, fast, and scale. So we sort of developed this server and we started working on it because we needed to and it, it, it sort of gotten a little bit out of control and it almost looks like it's turning into a product, although we're not a product shop, so we're just sort of working on it for our own internal projects and it seems to be working out just great. Um, um, so we have now about 10 developers, 12 developers, depending on the day. These are our sort of uh, tools and frameworks du jour. Um, don't ask me any detailed technical questions about these things because I sort of understand the high level, but not how they, they actually uh, get implemented by our, our brilliant team. So that I'll just leave it there. And that's it. I'm Brett Camper. I work at a place called uh, Mapsen. We um, uh, kind of lab in New York City, work on a bunch of open source projects. Uh, one of those that I've been working on is a, a, another WebGL mapping library called Tangram. Uh, we just put up a blog post about it yesterday, actually, so uh, you can check that out on our site. Um, I will go through the demo um, if, I, if it loads. Uh, okay, so let's see. Before I go through the actual demo, I'll talk a little bit about um, some components it uses. Uh, so it um, is implemented as a leaflet, um, leaflet plugin, actually using some of the um, some of the newer leaflet features that, that Vlad talked about earlier, um, some of the pre 1.0 stuff, uh, the new grid layer, um, uh, which is really nice, uh, much easier to work with. Uh, and it consumes vector tiles as you would expect because it's rendering uh, rendering vectors. Uh, for that, uh, as Jason mentioned, I, I also like to use um, kind of this simplest, like lowest common denominator, um, easiest to understand format. So in this case, I'm consuming mostly GeoJSON. Um, again, it's, it's not the fastest um, or most efficient, but it is um, the easiest to understand um, and debug. Uh, and so uh, Mapsen has this uh, pretty simple 
vector tile service uh, that you could check out that is free and runs off of an OSM planet import and will give you uh, will give you nice GeoJSON uh, tiles. Um, it also will serve the uh, the binary format, uh, the, the uh, mapnik based binary format um, as well if you want to use that. Um, this library also uses uh, the tessellation uh, library that uh, libtest that Brendan over there wrote. Um, so it you know it stands on on the shoulders of a lot of other things. Um, so anyway, um, mainly what I want to talk about um, is just kind of you know what you can do with this stuff that that you can't do with um, with traditional raster tiles. Um, I think Lauren gave a great overview of like the core components and why it's a huge pain to draw a line or pretty much anything in, in WebGL. Uh, so there is certainly a, a large hump to get over, but once you get over that, you can do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, so in this case, um, we're drawing you know, 3D geometry by extruding OSM buildings into, um, into polygons. Um, you can see we can do like very accurate uh, hit detection here with um, like pixel level uh, uh, feature detection, which, which lets us um, do some nice uh, kind of real time stuff. Is that live flowing water? Th this is my cheesy. Uh, this is my cheesy water effect uh, to kind of show off that, that you can do. Um, that, you know that you can do real time uh, animated uh, shaders and things like that. Um, you can do things like, uh, you know, without kind of getting into the whole like how the all, whole OpenGL pipeline works. You can use the, these things called the vertex shader and the fragment shader to kind of alter your geometry on the fly as you're drawing it, which lets you do things like you know turn perspective off. Oh, there we go. Or you know do like a kind of. Isometric style projection. Uh, you can play around with lighting. You can pretty easily turn different layers on and off. So you can turn off the roads, etc. Um, and then you, whoa, sorry, took a screenshot. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it's got a screenshot feature too. Uh, so you know the real fun is is kind of um, doing these different kinds of effects. Um, this is also always the one that kind of is most. Um, people tend to get the most response. Um, so these are, you know, th this is just to kind of show off like that you can, you can um, alter the geometry uh, client side in ways that would just be like not even possible in any kind of pre-rendered um, map. So you know, another one that I like is um, this uh, kind of, um, oh wow, interesting, this is not, it's not updating. So we would normally expect on this screen size. So this is a, a, an example of, 3D geometry in the middle of the screen that like fades to 2D towards the edges, and that starts to give you an idea of like the type of data viz stuff you can do. So you also have total real time control over like how much of that effect you're applying. Um, and then you can do similar things with uh, say procedural textures. So here's like a 3D uh, dot pattern applied to this geometry. Um, so these are not like raster textures; these are actually just procedurally generated on the fly. Um, similarly, you know you can do change all this stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, also also things like, um, like if you're familiar with the Stamen uh, toner style, um, you know, the ability to do kind of like, uh, do those kinds of effects, but do them on the fly, tweak them on the fly, not have to pre-render the entire world, um, et cetera. Um, so the real challenge of this, it's actually, once once you learn how to do this stuff, it's not that hard to just make a bunch of crazy effects like this. The, the real challenge is to try and make it um, like usable for, for other people and, and more consumable. Um, so a, a lot of what we're working on now is trying to create like a style sheet language around this that um, is more tightly bound to GLSL, which is the OpenGL shading language, uh, which is a, a, a pretty high bar to learn if you're not really familiar with OpenGL. Um, it's kind of a C variant. Um, is that like a, am I done or do I have like five seconds? Okay. <laughs> All right. All I will say is the elevator effect is one line of GLSL code, and that's the goal of the library is to awesome. make it easy. Um, so yeah, uh, Brian, thanks for asking me to give a talk. I am going to talk about JavaScript for approximately zero seconds. Um, this is one of my colleagues here, this is Derek Watkins. He's a real uh, great uh, colleague. He sits right next to me, and this is one of my favorite things I looked over and saw one day. It's like looking at this map of, uh, <laughs> of the U.S. of Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm from the New York Times. Um, and I'm also a student at uh, UW-Madison. Um, so I'm a cartographer there. We are about 35 or 40 strong. Uh, we have a San Francisco bureau and uh, a couple people in um, D.C. and one person in Paris. Uh, so we're a pretty big shop. Um, and this, there, we have like a little, we have a little crew of like uh, cartographers who work on like data-driven stuff and like big uh, sort of 
data visualization, and we have an entire maps department to do like all of the maps that you would see normally. Um, another guy we wor I work with here is uh, Jeremy White. This one might be good for you guys because I think he was like trying to decode some uh, crazy uh, binary something or other. Um, uh, so, yeah, you know, actually we do, so to not, well, maybe this will work, um, completely ignore the, uh, the JavaScript thing. Um, one thing we do use JavaScript for uh, that you wouldn't maybe expect is we do a lot of Illustrator scripting. Uh, which is kind of JavaScripty, um, and uh, our deputy RTSA wrote a little thing called uh, AI to HTML, which will take uh, multiple artboards in Illustrator um, and create uh, yeah, like a, a, a on a website. It makes it um, so that you can like resize the browser. You can like load it up, and it, it seamlessly loads for you, and um, I really wish that this weren't like that. Um, but so that the text uh, scales and, and moves on the screen. Uh, so this is actually like these, like down here, let's see here, picture. So like these maps, uh, this, this text is a uh, vector, um, but as you like move it around, it kind of, this is not gonna work. <laughs> Boy, um, I feel like, although like I'm that guy now. Um, let's just, all right, let's get to this. So, all right, this is what I kind of want to talk about. It's not at all JavaScript. We make maps really frequently that are ethnographic because the conflicts that we're mapping are, uh, if they are along ethnographic lines, they certainly are relevant to the conflict. Um, and um, many of you probably have mapped, uh, done eth ethnographic mapping in the past. And if you have, you would almost certainly have a come across this guy. Uh, Mike Izadi at Columbia. Have any of you heard of him? No one. All right, well, now you have. Um, he uh, has done decades of research and just created a, an absolute like library of um, ethnographic maps. This one, this map here that we did for this Caucasus project we did in advance of the, uh, the Olympics was uh, based on this map that he made, which you'll notice is a bit... Uh, complicated. Um, he works in Apple Works. Any of you know this program from 1984? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he actually still works in Apple Works and um, he, uh, his computers that he bought up when he realized that, that, uh, that like, this was not going to be something that was going to be available on new machines are slowly dying and he's kind of like afraid that his work is just going to forever disappear. So maps like, uh, so here's, here's another guy that we did. So, that, uh, so this map that we made of uh, Baghdad, uh, the ethnography and uh, ethnographic groups in Baghdad is based on a map like this. But his, since his file, like he's creating it, these old, old like AppleWorks file, it's uh, converting them into a usable map format. Now it's a little bit problematic. So. They can be converted to vectors. Um, it's a little bit time consuming. Um, but he has, I think he said he has over 300 maps that he's made over the years. They're all in this format. And we're trying to pitch to him that he should uh, open up his uh, collection of maps, uh, make them uh, freely available with like a Creative Commons license uh, in exchange for having uh, people like digitize his work. And it wouldn't be hand digitizing as much as it would be dealing with this file format and getting them into like a, uh, a geo like file format that'll last for a while. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, this is me. Um, send me send me an email or just come talk to me. Um, sorry about my browser window. Um, and if you want a, a good story about leaking coffee cups, you can come talk to me about that. It's <laughs> coffee cup for you. Yeah, so I, I didn't actually plan on doing this, but I decided it's, it would be nice to share with you some of the little stuff I was doing uh, on GitHub besides Leaflet and Mailbox stuff. So I have a hobby. I choose some, like, I like to choose some really specific uh, small domain. For, for example, 
an obscure algorithm that's useful in some of our work and uh, like make uh, the best library that implements it, like the, the smallest and the fastest and better than alternative. So I, I've been doing some small projects like this. For example, the first example is Simplify.js. It's a library that uh, takes uh, an array of points and simplifies it, and it does so really, really fast, like faster than any other uh, libraries. And actually, I extracted it from Leaflet code and make it a small separate library. So you can see in the example, there's a 73,000, 74,000 uh, points, and they get simplified in real time in less than one millisecond. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's quite fast. Uh, so, and you can see that it's actually less than, like, a bit more than 100 lines of code. Uh, the next project I have is uh, SunCalc. So, I've been, uh, I, I really wanted to do uh, a map with, like, that would show some position, so I got into uh, some astronomy articles uh, and calculations for a couple of weeks uh, to figure this out. It's pretty complicated, but uh, I built a library called SanCalc. It's also pretty small, like 240 lines of code, and it allows you to calculate uh, sun positions for a given uh, latitude, longitude, and date, and times of the sun phases, like where the sun where and when the sun rises, the sunset, and etc. And sun position at any point of time on any place on Earth. So it's times like sunrise, sun, golden hour, uh, dusk, and stuff like this. And uh, it also calculates moon position and moonlight phases. It's pretty simple, easy to use, and I actually have an example of uh, using this library, but I'm pretty embarrassed to show it because I wrote, I wrote it four years ago before Liquid uh, was uh, uh, created, and it's Google Map based. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, we have somebody from Google here, so be positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see it's, it's a Google Map where uh, there's a bug. He doesn't show you sunset for, for some reason, but uh, like... Yeah, but it's, uh, okay, it's just an example. Um, and, yeah, you can actually see the, the amount of sunlight a particular place has, like, throughout the year. Uh, okay, the next uh, is uh, Dead Simple Grid. So I was uh, fed up with uh, uh, lots of uh, frameworks, uh, like, trying to propose a new way to uh, do rep responsive design. Like, uh, there were, like, there are tens and tens of uh, different uh, responsive design frameworks, and I decided to beat them all and uh, build uh, a responsive design framework in 20, 250 bytes. So the framework is, here's the, the code. This is the whole code of the framework. And it's, it actually works. So we have, this is... An example, and it's like if I had a bigger screen, it would do more stuff. So it's really nice, grid-like framework. The next one is Airbrush. It's uh, it's uh, some of uh, my more, more advanced work. It's a library that implements R tree structure for indexing uh, spatial data in in JavaScript. And it's, it's quite a spef specific library, but uh, it's been really useful in some applications like Mapbox GLGS. It, it really depends on it when it uh, does its uh, labeling and interactive uh, features because it needs to... Uh, so I, I'll show you an example. So we have uh, lots and lots of uh, rectangles over, this, over the 2D, 2D space, and you want to search them really, really fast. So you, can, you, you, you want to answer queries like, in this big box, give me all the, all the items really fast. So it builds a, a tree structure, and there are some really heavy optimizations, and I read through lots of algorithms and papers on R trees, and uh, it's really, really fast. Like 100,000 uh, items get inserted in 100 
milliseconds, and then when you search, it's actually like almost no time. And uh, there are also bulk insertion algorithms that are even faster. Uh, it's used in Navas GLGS, it's used in OpenWares 3, so I'm kind of contributed to OpenWares. Uh, it's used uh, in ID, OpenStreetMap Editor, and uh, in some other nice uh, applications. So there's also a small library called SimpleHeat. It, it's really, really simple uh, heat map implementation. I just, I didn't found a really, really simple implementation, simple, simple of, of heat maps, because they all were trying to do too much, but uh, I decided to make like a super simple, the, the most simple library that could do heat maps, and it's 140 lines of code. And there's a leaflet plugin, leaflet heat, that uses this. Uh, here's, well, here's this one. Okay. This is leaflet heat. Okay, so the next one is Sado triangulation that uh, Warren mentioned. It's the fastest, fastest triangulation library so far. Uh, it's, it has, it's like there's a compromise. It doesn't handle some really uh, bad cases of really cramped data like intersecting edges or collinear edges, but it's still the fastest by far. And uh, the latest project I want to show you, it's actually my, like, the most seminal work that I did. Uh, it's, and I don't know why it didn't get much exposure, but it's much more important than my legal work. It's called Bolshe.js. And uh, it's a book marklet. It, it uh, keeps a, uh, let me see. Okay, it keeps a list of uh, bullshit marketing terms. <laughs> like, these are, Regular experience. It, it's not actually geo related, but it's still very useful. For example, you want to understand what uh, uh, some company website says. So here's a company I worked for uh, earlier, Cognance, uh, like a consulting firm, and let's run it through. through the <laughs> so you can actually see what what the terms are, but uh, you start to like uh, really understand what, what it's all about. <laughs> Let me see a better... Vlad, <laughs> oh. uh, I'm a geospatial consultant and I'm deeply offended. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite project. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is a fun lightning part because I also have like 5% battery left, so it's like both. It'll just end when either my computer runs out of battery or you buzz me. So I work for Esri and I work on um, Esri Leaflet, which is just a plug-in to plug ArcGIS and Esri stuff into Leaflet. Um, but one of the things I started getting asked, like, every single customer ever was like, well, can I use my non-mercator tiles with it because we have to use state plane whatever. And I'm an art major, so I was like, well, what the hell's a projection? Um, so I pretty much just ignored them for a really long time until someone wrote this demo, and I met them at, Esri, at the Esri Devel Developer Summit, and they were like, I was talking with someone else about it, and they asked that question, and he was in the group, and he's like, oh, I solved that. And I was like, well, could you, you know, write a sample of it? So this is actually his demo showing, see, I can prove that this is not in Mercator, because that, oh. right. But this is, um, but he's a developer at the state of Utah, Scott Davis, um, and it's actually kind of deceptively easy looking until you realize that so this is, you just put in the EPSG code, and this is the proj for js definition for that code. This is a magic number. Uh, <laughs> and, then you have some, and then you have the list of all the tile resolutions. So these are the resolutions that map to the zoom levels. Um, and then you actually just pass that object to the CRS. And then you can just ignore the fact that this says Esri, because this basically is like 10 lines on top of tile layer that just builds the URL out. Um, but that gets you like tiles, and when I said that I had a demo of this, I got really terrified because I never actually put any like GeoJSON data on top of it. So I did that really quick. Um, this is actually just it queries a bunch of data from ArcGIS and converts it to GeoJSON on the client. So 
You can see the zip code data that actually like lines up at the edges of the state, so it does geojson data and dumps that on the map just fine. So we're reprojecting geographic data. Right. So it queries fly. the geographic data and it'll reproject it on the fly for you on the client side. Right. Um, so this the one the one like kind of gotcha on this is actually finding. So if you know like this is the same EPSG code that was over here. There we go. So you can just plug that into spatialreference.org, and this is how you get the proj for js definition. It's just that. APGS.io. I don't. Okay, I'll look at it later. <laughs> Isn't that GIS okay. Trade secrets, right. So I, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> EPSG.io. So, and if you go to like the ArcGIS server, you can actually the list of resolutions. Look at this in JSON. Um, JSON's easier to read than that. So this is actually like all the resolutions for all the tiles get baked out as a part of the service when you bake out the tiles. So it's pretty much just like for ArcGIS stuff, if you like come across these tiles somewhere, you can actually just like copy paste everything over. And I was sitting there like getting this ready and I just realized that this transformation value that's in here because I've been trying for months to figure out like where this, what this value is. <laughs> Because um, it just seemed like this magic number, and if you put any other numbers in there, it won't work. But it's actually, uh, if anyone knows what that is exactly in explicit terms, you should tell me, because I really want to know. Uh, somewhere in here, oh, come on, origin, tile info, extents, info, oh, come on. Uh, I just found it. It's actually, the numbers are the exact same as the origin. So if I scroll all the way down here, it actually says origin, and the absolute values of those numbers are the same. So I don't know if that's actually just an ArcGIS server thing where the origin, and then you just turn that into some other magic numbers, and it just magically works. Um, that's kind of what projections feel like to me. Like someone just said, like, Albers, and it goes. <laughs> But anyway, that is, it does work, and if you know the projections and the scales and the transformation and everything else, it does actually work, and you can put it together. The guys who did Proj for Leaflet did a great job, and Calvin on Proj for JS. So I think I'm down to like 2 or 3% battery, so it's probably a good time to stop. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs>